Okay, so um, today, as you all know, we're going to go through some aspects about the personal statement. Um, I have some examples for you, some tips, of course, as well as, um, you know, I guess the tips or the do's. We've got some don'ts. And then I'll also have some examples um, to show you as well. Okay. Uh, hold on, I want to change my side here so I can see a little bit more of you guys. Um, okay, that's not it. Okay, um, so what is a personal statement, right? So generally speaking, a two to three page typed, um, I think that's, that's pretty obvious, I didn't put that here, uh, double spaced document. There may be a specific question or questions that you either can or must answer, um, meaning the schools have decided that that's really what they want you to address, um, that's what they think is gonna be the most helpful in their review process. Um, or, as is the case with many schools, including Southwestern, um, it's an open-ended prompt, meaning you can write about anything, but you can't write about everything. Um, and part of that is because of the space constraints, right? Two to three pages um, isn't a ton of space when you have lots of, um, you know, different content that you're considering and, and things like that. So. Uh, hopefully you'll find the, the tips kind of help you pin down what would be appropriate. Okay, so why do law schools use personal statements? It's obviously a writing sample. This is something in addition to the LSAT writing sample, which is required. It allows readers of your application to learn more about you as a candidate. It's, in, it's used in lieu of an interview. So at Southwestern, we do have some interviews that we offer. Um, the SCALE program that I mentioned does require an interview as part of the application process. And then we do also offer wait, uh, wait list interviews. But for the vast majority of our applicant pool, an interview is not going to take place during that application cycle. So this personal statement is basically your written interview. And I think that's a really important tip to kind of always file away in the back of your mind because if you thought about what you would come to a physical interview um, or if you had a one-on-one -on -one interview, even if it was over, you know, Zoom or something like this, I think most people understand what they would want to share about themselves in an in-person interview. It's hard to sometimes translate that into written form, but if you always just kind of, again, keep that in the back of your mind, it'll help you figure out, right, you would want to lead with things that were positive, you would want to um, really try to convey why you're such a great candidate. And that's, you know, the last bullet point on this slide. Um, it helps answer for schools the question of why you, right? We have so few things that we can consider about a person when we're re reviewing their file. We have LSAT scores, we have undergraduate performance. Of course, that includes where they went to school, when they went to school, right? So how far out are you from your graduation point, what you majored in, what your professional experience looks like, all of those things. But, you know, it's always um, a really critical part of the process for us to help understand who are we um, considering to be to join us in our community. Um, so the other points here, it's a reflection of your judgment and professionalism. I'm going to say judgment probably a hundred times uh, just during this workshop because it's a really key component. Um, and it also allows schools to see how interested you are in their particular school. Um, so to the extent that that's something you want to cover um, somewhere, it can be effective if used appropriately. Okay, so we're going to go into some tips now. Um, so your first tip, and I'm going to take questions after tips, and then um, we'll have another break point for, for questions too. Okay, so your first tip, be accurate. Read through the personal statement, um, either the questions be spe specifically being asked or if it's open-ended, and determine what, if anything in particular, is being asked of you. Following directions is the first step in demonstrating you have the seriousness and attention to detail necessary. 
when in doubt, and this is true about every single aspect of the application process, but when in doubt, you can always reach out to the admissions office um, for any questions you have about you know, anything you don't necessarily think is clear or you're not sure where to put a certain piece of information about yourself. Um, usually a quick phone call can answer most questions, sometimes an email. What we can't do is to preview your personal statement for you to give you feedback. But if you have a, a question, you know, that you just want to get some clarity on, we can certainly help with that. And following directions is a really key part of everything in the admissions process. Okay, be personal. That sounds kind of silly, and obviously it's called a personal statement for a reason, but um, sometimes uh, applicants are really intimidated by the process. So hopefully these tips will help you kind of figure out how to make it more achievable. But right from the first person, it is about you. Um, that's not the way most written assignments were executed when you were in school. It's not the way you normally write a professional document. But in this case, writing from the first person is the best way to kind of tell your story. Um, it should allow schools to get an opportunity to see, you know, maybe why you want to go to law school, to tell us how you would contribute to our communities, maybe how you could be a good fit for us. Obviously, for you to do some of these things, you need to have done your research on the schools. You need to know or have an idea, at least, why you're even interested in us in the first place. Um, and you do that by having a genuine um, appreciation for either the programs or maybe it's the location, right? You maybe you know you really want to be, let's say, in Los Angeles specifically, um, whatever those reasons are for you. And then trying to bridge all of those things together. Okay, be confident. Your personal statement, again, I mentioned it's like your written interview. So if you go into uh, a, a typical interview setting and you seem, you know, unsure of yourself or you walk in and you say, you know, oh gosh, let me tell you about all these things I've done wrong, you're not going to make the best impression. And that's not to say that in the application you don't necessarily need to address some things that may have some shortcomings because um, most people probably have something that they need to explain, but the, the appropriate place for those things, whether it's a lower LSAT score, or dip in your grades or, you know, breaks in your education, whatever it may be, you put all of that kind of information in an addendum or a series of addenda. Use the personal statement to really be, you know, I'm amazing, I'm a rock star, you know, maybe I've overcome some things, but I'm better because of those challenges. Um, so the a misconception that a lot of applicants have is that you have to have like a, a sob story or something like that. And that is untrue. I mean, unfortunately, people do go through a lot of hard things in their lives. Um, and, you know, what we're living in now is just one of those examples of, I'm sure, content that we're going to be seeing in applications this year. But you don't have to feel like it needs to be a sob story or something really dramatic. You all know or hopefully know why you want to go to law school. And whatever that may be, if it's to help your family or help your community, to help yourself, if you think it's a great career because you know you could have financial independence, whatever it is, um, figure out a way to incorporate those things. Okay, be impactful. What it means here when it says no one else's story would be quite like yours, um, that's, the, that's the absolute truth, right? No one else is walking your same life in your shoes. Even people in your family member, in your family member and, and friend community are not living the same exact experience. So draw from things that you feel are really important um, that are happening to you. A personal pet peeve of mine is the use of quotes. Um, it's, you're, you might see it again in a few other don'ts, but um, it's not something that generally people execute well. And so my general rule is to kind of avoid them. I feel like that is different though than what some people have as a, a mantra, if you will. Words that they use um, to kind of get them through tough times or if people like to do daily affirmations, sometimes things like that really resonate. That's different. Um, you know, or sometimes there's kind of a, you know, maybe a quote from a family member that's really stuck with you. I feel like that's different than just trying to like plop in, you know, a quote from a, political leader or social activist or 
you know, again, if, if you don't really understand the quote and you can't use it properly, it just doesn't come across, across very genuine. Okay, being meticulous. This goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyways. Make sure that your personal statement is incredibly flawless, as flawless as it can be. You know, not only is this such an important writing sample in your application, but it's really our first chance to see who you are as professionals um, who want to go into a professional career. And so down the road, when you're all practicing attorneys and you have to submit documents to court, you know, small errors can, you know, really determine the fate of someone else's life or their property or their custody or, you know, really, really significant things. So it's really important for us to know that people are going to take all, prof all aspects of this process seriously. And um, silly mistakes can undermine, you know, um, how you come across. So make sure it's proofread, not just by you, but give it to others. Um, it should be proofread clearly for things like grammar, but also, you know, for tone, for content, all of those things. Read it out loud too, that always helps. Okay, being judicious. This is really, really important because, um, you know, beyond just what the description on the screen says, you're not going to be able to write about everything that's happened to you for as long as you've been alive. You're going to have to whittle it down to probably just a few things or maybe only one thing. So common themes for an open-ended prompt, you know, could include why you want to go to law school, why a specific law school, why you want to pursue a certain type of law, um, about it can include challenges you've overcome, it can include, um, you know, a few of those things sometimes together, but you're going to have to break it apart. Um, we're not going to spend time today really focusing on things like the diversity statement or optional essays, but those could be other avenues to convey some additional content about yourselves um, if you're looking for a place to put it. And then, um, but you know, of course, always making sure you're following the directions from the schools because they're gonna give you exactly kind of what they expect to receive. Um, so again, I mentioned we're gonna talk about judgment a lot. Judgment's a really, really important part of really all aspects of this process, not just who you ask to write letters on your behalf for your letters of recommendation, um, but also the content that you choose for your personal statement. Um, and making sure that everything is just tip top. Okay, so I am going to stop sharing now and see if there's any questions so far. And then we're gonna get into to some of the don'ts. So anyone know if they have any questions so far, you can use the, the hand raise feature in Zoom or go old school and kind of wave at me. Okay, I see Mandy. Mandy W, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, so my question was, I've asked a lot of other people who have written personal statements and stuff that kind of, what do you do to get people interested in you right away? Like that first paragraph, a lot of people call it their hook. Kind of what's your advice in finding what that hook is gonna be for your statement? Okay, that's a great question. I wish there was an easy answer. Um, Maybe I should have done questions after I showed you my, my don'ts because there's a few don'ts that might correlate to this. Um, but going back to one of the slides where I, I said, I don't care for the quotes, that's oftentimes where people will drop in that quote. And again, that's why it doesn't really translate the way they think it will because it's just like hangs there and you're just kind of like, okay, that's nice. Um, it's not a creative writing piece. So that's the other thing that's important to remember. You don't need this super hook um, or, you know, really dramatic opening statement. You don't need it. Um, sometimes I think you just start telling the story, whatever it is. Just start. I think it, and I, and I don't say that to imply that just starting writing your personal statement is easy. It's obviously really hard. Um, I would suggest you write many different drafts of many different themes. 
So write a draft of a personal statement about why you want to go to law school. Write a draft of your personal statement about something you've overcome. Write a draft of an, another personal statement version of why a specific school or why an area of law. You'll start to kind of get a sense of which things have better flow, which things you have more to say about. You might find that maybe two things are very complementary and you can blend them together. Um, but as far as just that opener, don't try to be like super memorable. Um, you will be memorable on the whole. You're not going to be memorable just on base, like on the first line of your personal statement. If you are memorable for that reason, it's probably not a favorable impression. So don't worry about just like, oh, I've got to like write the best tagline about myself ever. And don't do that. Just, just start. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes they can just be really straightforward and say, you know, when I was growing up, this is how, this is something that shaped my life. And it just starts. So just try to be organic. Again, always keep in the back of your mind, this is like a written interview. If you were going to come in to an in-person interview, would you have like some really choreographed, well-rehearsed tagline? And probably not unless you're like trying out for like a reality show, right? So just kind of be more organic with it. Um, okay, next question up is going to be Elizabeth Mejia. You can unmute yourself. Sorry, it just takes me a second to unmute myself. Hi, no, thank you no for problem. doing this. Sure. Um, so my question is, I'm at the point in my personal statement where I'm having a hard time deciphering how, how best to present myself if all of the motivating forces that cause me to be interested in the law are a bit controversial and political. Okay. For instance, um, I... I'm really concerned about some of the politics and some of the direction that it's heading or the way that um, the internet is being used um, among certain people to not be too specific. Okay. So um, I have heard many, many times that you need to create one personal statement and then kind of tweak it for all of the schools. So in, in that regard, if I have so many controversial topics, how do you think I should best attack that? So first of all, I don't know that I agree with the advice that you should just create one and then tweak. I don't know that one size fits all. I think maybe somebody could do that. But I think going back to, it just depends on what you want to cover in your personal statement. You know, maybe you don't need to tweak it at all, depending, or maybe you have to write five different personal statements for five different schools if that's the number you're considering. So I, I challenge you on that just first part. I don't know that I completely agree. In terms of what is controversial or what isn't controversial, um, you're going to see this is going to be like the, the top of my don'ts list. You don't know who's going to read your file. You don't know what my bias is. You don't know what anybody else's bias is. So you have to be able to, con uh, to communicate professionally and civilly. That's going to be important in a classroom. It's important on paper. That does not mean you can't have your strong opinions. You just have to be able to communicate your opinion in a way that is not, you know, disrespectful or unprofessional or, you know, really could uh, offend someone. Right? You don't want to do that. And, and so here's an example. One of our professors um, who sometimes would do, you know, an exercise kind of like this with me had shared, you know, to a large group of students that um, it really bothered him. And as soon as you hear why, I think you will all, you'll all agree it would bother you too, most likely. It really bothered him when he read personal statements where people heralded, put up on a pedestal, praised um, Hitler. And the first time he said that to a group of people, I thought, how did, what is he talking, he got a personal statement that had that in it? Like, gosh, wow, that's crazy, right? I had not received a personal statement where that was communicated. And he, as a Jewish person, was, you know, he doubled down on being offended. 
And to find out later, he's not read it once, he's read it twice. Now, granted, it's been over hundreds of applications, so it's not like that's a norm, but you know, just because I never had received a personal statement like that, I didn't know that he did. And this goes to, you don't know who's gonna read your file and you don't know what they bring to the table. So there are certainly differences of opinion across everything somebody could have an opinion about. And we see that in the classroom all the time. It's true now, it's true 10 years ago, it'll be true 50 years from now. There's always gonna be differences, but you have to be able to communicate those differences effectively. So I'm not at all suggesting that you can't talk about the things that are controversial because if they're important to you and they're important to what you wanna communicate about why you wanna to go to law school, then go ahead. Just do it in a way that is not polarizing. That's the best advice I could give you about that um, on the whole, that there will be some schools based on their own mission statement, their own belief system, their particulars, where they're not going to be as accepting of some of those differences of opinion. And, you know, that's maybe something for you to have figured out and done your research on maybe before you're applying to them to see if you're a good fit for their school. But, um, you know, ultimately, the personal statement can make or break someone's application, you know, because it's, it's the personal aspect. And so if a school decides that they just don't think you're a good fit for them, you know, if it's something you want to stand behind and that's, those are your convictions, then it sounds like it's probably a, a, a going to be a good decision for both of you that you don't end up there. But um, you just have to walk that line really carefully. It's, it's a tough one, but I see people do it all the time and they do it well. Okay. Um, so next one up is going to be David H. Is it Harch? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Harch. Um, Go ahead, David. How do you feel about people using humor in their personal statements? Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Like, um, kind of like talking about something serious, but bringing like brevity to it and um, making like, it, it's kind of, I don't want to take like something that's like too big of a hit or miss. You know what I mean? I think humor when done well can, can go over really well. Um, I think that's not true of sarcasm, so I probably wouldn't have sarcasm in a statement, but a little bit of levity can, can be done very well. You just have to be judicious about how much, right? You don't want to write a comedy skit. Um, but if, you know, there's like a funny little anecdote in there, there's a funny little story about how something came to resolve, um, yeah, there's, there's a little bit that you can do um, that can go over really well. Just be really limited in how much. Okay, um, I saw an actual raised hand. Elizabeth, I can't see your whole name on here. Is it Morales or something of that nature? You've got a Morehouse, Morehouse? Okay, I only see part of your last name showing. Um, thank you guys for doing this, it's really helpful. Uh, I was just wondering, I know you said don't start with like a hook, especially if it's some generic quote. How personally do you feel about people jumping right in versus giving a little bit more of a history or background? I know there's kind of a balance where you're, you don't want the entire personal statement to be taken up by background, but there's also the balance of providing enough context so it makes sense. Yeah, I think, um... I think probably no more than one or two paragraphs on background. But I think I agree, it can be helpful. It gives us that, that context. Um, okay, so I see actual raised hand. It's coming under Jennifer Guild. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Close enough, we'll go with that. I'm sorry, tell me how to say it. Is it Guild? Very good. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I try, I'm my, trying. <laughs> my, mine actually plays into uh, Elizabeth who just asked, and I think this will help Victoria as well. So I am kind 
coming, I already have a PhD in computer science, so I'm coming from a STEM environment and interested in going to law. So a lot of the reasons behind why I'm going into law is influenced by the past, by my experiences. But if it's only two to three paragraphs that's interesting, um, would you limit it to that with when you already have a background in STEM and you're trying to explain why you want to go to law or just kind of limit the background? It, it, see where I'm going? Yeah, let me, let me clarify a little bit. So okay. what I had in my mind when Elizabeth asked her question is a really common example of a personal statement that we see is a really influential elderly family member this person has been influenced by. Okay. So it's enough context for that type of scenario to only spend one or two paragraphs kind of laying that, that framework. More time spent on talking about that person ends up being a personal statement or biography of that person, okay. right? So that's, that's what I was thinking of when she asked the question. That okay. is not to say that there are not other themes where it's not even really background so much as it's, it's, the, whole, it's the whole shebang is why you wanna do law school, right? That may be what you spend the whole personal statement on. Things that you've okay. encountered, you know, Maybe it's a limitation that you've experienced in your career and that you had that like aha moment, right? Or maybe you got into this career thus far for X reasons. And then as your career evolved, you know, now you want to go to Y. That can be okay. your whole personal statement. So it's not going to be just the one or two sort of intro paragraphs. So okay. uh, I'm glad you asked your question so I could clarify, but it, it just depends on what you want to communicate. And again, if you were an in-person interview, you would give it however uh, much space it needed for that discussion to be effective. Do you have any suggestions for people coming from the STEM environment to the law environment? Not a specific suggestion as it pertains to just the personal statement, but I would say on the whole, um, we've seen a lot more of those transitions in probably the last five to seven years. Um, and there's been, you know, resurgences in certain communities, like, you know, the west side of Los Angeles, for example, now they have a silly name for it. they call it Silicon Beach, because yeah, you know, we have Silicon Valley in Northern California. So um, I don't think it's as unusual as it might have been in the past. But you would want to still make sure you've got great interpersonal skills, you've got great writing skills, you've got great human skills because there can be a misconception that people with a STEM background are more insular and maybe haven't perfected as much of um, these skill sets as you know, humanities majors or social scientists and things like that. So you wanna try to make sure all of that comes across really comprehensively. You do that also with who you ask to write your letters for you. People that have been project managers perhaps or supervisors and they can attest to how you work in a team, um, how strong your work product is for things that maybe involve, you know, oral presentations and, you know, written submissions and things like that. So it's, it's kind of taking a step back from your entire package um, and okay. figuring out how to be strategic. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I'm going to take one more question here and then we're going to go back to the slide and then more questions after. So the next question up I have here is going to be Cameron uh, Kratz, Kratz? Uh, Kratz, thank you. Kratz. Um, yeah, so I've noticed as I, you know, start to bounce on ideas for my personal statement, um, I have one that's kind of more focused on, uh, you know, resiliency in the face of obstacles throughout my life. And, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, is this something that would make a good personal statement or is this something that could also be used as like a diversity statement a little bit, like in terms of like you know, economic hardships and like chronic illness and all that and resiliency in face of those obstacles. So do you think that is something that would be better suited for like a personal statement or is that more diversity statement? Uh, it sounds flippant, but my answer is really just yes. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, could, be, it could be either, um, mm. I think. I could definitely see how it could be in either one of those types of documents. 
sometimes what people do when they know they're going to submit a diversity statement is they might, okay, let me, let me just take a step back. Again, thinking about the different things you want to communicate on the whole. If you decide to write your personal statement on resiliency and things you've overcome, and one aspect of that may have been economic hardship, okay? You might sort of tease it there to give it some fullness with the whole personal statement and then use the diversity statement to really expand upon it, right? Not regurgitate, but really let that be a theme, a central theme of the diversity statement if you wanted to have both with adequate mm -hmm. coverage. So, so that's you, one way that sometimes people do it, or they write about mm -hmm. two totally different things between those two documents. Mm -hmm. So let's say the overall theme is resiliency. And you have a bunch of different examples throughout your life. Is that something you then recommend for a personal statement since you have, you know, a broader range of things you're kind of covering or, and the diversity statements for like maybe one specific difficulty? If it's, no, or... it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be. Okay. It can be more broad and cover a longer period of time as well. Um, and in terms of health, you know, I've seen great personal statements written about an illness that somebody went through um, or their family members went through and how they saw maybe the medical field handle mm. the situation or didn't in some cases, um, mm. you know, things like that. People also can end up sharing information. Let's just use health. They can end up sharing information about challenges with their health because it may have affected you know, how they performed in school. So they may end up actually sharing a piece about their health mm -hmm. in an addendum about their grades. Right. So, right. you know, I would say one thing you could do is maybe make a checklist of things you know you want, you know you need to explain and or you want to share. Mm -hmm. And then you can start kind of assigning, okay, this is going to go to an addendum. This is going to go in the diversity statement. This is going to go in the personal statement. You know, and you might have to cross out some things, you know, as I said at the very beginning, you can write about anything, but not everything. Mm -hmm. So you might have to prioritize which are the most important things. Okay. And then there can be overlap a little bit between your personal statement and diversity. Yes. That's as long as it's not just regurgitation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Okay. I'm going to go back to the slide and then we'll come back for questions. Gosh. Okay. Now I have to make sure I share this with you all correctly again. <laughs> Roxana, I'm going to ask you in just a sec. How is that, Roxana? Is that the right screen? Okay, I'm not sure what happened. Roxanne, are you there? Yeah, sorry. So I'm gonna go back. Go ahead and try. Yeah. I didn't realize I was on mute. That's okay. Okay. And back to sharing. So we're not seeing just one slide. You're seeing everything? Yes. Okay. I don't know why this got so hard for me today. Maybe it's a Friday. Let's go with that. I'm having a hard time because it's Friday. Okay, what about now? No, it's still like in presenter mode. Now? Now we don't see anything. What happened? Oh my gosh, guys, I'm sorry. It stopped on me. You see That's all the good. slides. It's no, good? you see, yep. Okay, are, are you looking at the what not to do? We're looking at be judicious. You're looking at be judicious, okay. All right, so what not to do? Don't offend the reader. We already covered this with um, Elizabeth's question. Um, again, just to reiterate, that doesn't mean you can't take 
stand about something that's important to you in your personal statement, just do it with professionalism. Don't be crass. Okay, so hopefully that goes without saying, but some examples of what I've seen in the past are people using profanity in the statement um, because I think they think it kind of like makes a strong impact um, or people talk about uh, behaviors that they have, you know, in social settings. Um, they mention having, you know, casual sex, just things that are not appropriate. Again, things you wouldn't say during an interview. So you want to leave that off. Uh, we talked about the quotes. Um, we talked too much about talking about someone else. Using the wrong school's name. Okay, this happens a lot. Um, this is what happens when someone does only write one personal statement and tries to tweak it for each school. And the way they think they are tweaking it is they have, you know, a closing line or closing paragraph and it says, you know, Southwestern Law School is the best school for me. But what they submit to me says, Loyola Law School is the best school for me or California Western is the best school for me or whatever it is. Um, it goes back to not being meticulous, right? Which was tip five. Um, it's sloppy, it's disrespectful, um, and it's completely avoidable. So make sure that you don't submit a statement to one school that has another school's name in it. I have denied people for that very reason. Don't try to stand out by doing strange things. So strange um, includes things like writing a legal brief. That is not your personal statement. That's not what you should do. It's not writing a skit. I think I mentioned that. You do not want to um, write a poem or you know, send some kind of abstract drawing. These are strange things, but people do them. So you do not want to stand out in this kind of way. Um, don't discuss negatives in your academics or else that performance, you might remember one of the tips was to be confident. So you wouldn't go into an interview and just start telling somebody how badly you do on, on standardized tests or why your grades, you know, took a downward turn. You wouldn't do that. Um, that doesn't mean you don't need to necessarily explain that in your application but it needs to go somewhere else, like an addendum. The difference here, um, though, is you can overcome something that was really negative. You can have had really bad grades and had this great epiphany and really seen that you were in the wrong major for all the wrong reasons. And then once you switched to something, it got you on this like more law school type of track. You can definitely talk about how something was a negative and how you turned it into a positive. That could be okay, but you don't want to just spend time in your personal statement saying how you did, you know, poorly or all the wrong things in a situation. You got to have the, the savvy to know the difference. Um, don't worry about telling the admissions committee what you think we want to hear. You don't actually know what any one person wants to hear at any given moment. So Sometimes I like a personal statement that makes me laugh, right? So I answered the question earlier that levity can definitely be helpful. Um, sometimes I like a personal statement that makes me cry. They, they definitely can do that. Sometimes I just want to read something that is well written. You don't really know. Um, and it does change because, you know, being a file reader is a very subjective process. So just do your part by writing something that's a quality piece. Um, and then don't assume you'll get another chance to make a first impression, okay? This is your impression. You may never meet an actual person in the admissions process to give them a different feel for you than what they're reading. Don't assume you're gonna get to have an interview um, because as I said, most people don't experience one. Don't assume that you're gonna get to send another statement. We don't ask you to write another statement and send in something else. Um, so really what you put in your entire admissions packet when you first submit, you should assume is the only pieces of information that will be considered. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to show you some personal statement excerpts now. There's going to be samples from two different people. Um, and then we'll do questions after that so I don't uh, mess up the screen share again. So um, these are people who've submitted their applications to us to use for exercises such as this. Um, I'm not going to read them all to you, but you can kind of get a sense. These are not openers, but there are some closing pieces that I've included. So in sample one, this person was trying to convey um, a little bit of family information. So it's a little bit of that background um, that was asked about, kind of laying the groundwork for um, what had happened in her family so that um, she could explain to us why she wanted to pursue law school, right? So you see at the end of this passage, I wanted and needed to pursue the law. So I know when I'm reading, when I get to that part in the statement, which did occur pretty early on, um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn a little bit more about why law, okay? Plus I'm also getting a taste of some of the family challenges as well, okay? So the next portions from this person, she's now describing to me why family law, okay? Um, I've worked hard to get to where I am, supported my family with financial hardship, her mother's illness, why she thinks Southwestern is the next step. She's dropped in some information about one of our clinics, how we think, how she thinks, you know, that our program can help her, also then help her community. And then, um, you know, this is the, the last portion here is one of her closing statements. This story has propelled me through my life. I've learned to be resilient and have matured into a curious pre-professional ready to empower myself and others through family law. This purpose will give meaning to my work. So all throughout, she kind of wove in um, different things about stuff she had gone through as a child, as a young adult, um, as an adult, how she worked um, 80 hours a week to support herself and her family in school. Um, and that, you know, she's got this real vision now for, for this next chapter, okay? Sample two, different person. Um, this person, I will tell you, had a very jarring opening section to their personal statement. Um, usually when we share the whole statement, I see eyes get really wide. She, she went in for it really hard. It was very graphic, describing some of the abuse that she had suffered um, as a foster child. So um, I'm not sharing it here, mostly because of brevity, um, but you know, it, it definitely was there. It definitely catches your attention. I could see for some people though, where it might be really jarring for them and it might kind of force them to kind of disconnect a little bit from reading the rest because they might've been um, a little overwhelmed. But so she, she talks here, this is about uh, midway through the personal statement. Um, and so she's talking about ways in which, you know, she's really empowering herself um, as a former foster youth, things she's doing in college. Um, and then here she's realizing, you know, that also um, this, this research and her passion in working with foster youth is what's leading her to want to pursue this career in law. Um, and this is kind of basically how she, she ties it all together at the end. Um, She's letting us know that she really understands the community of people that she wants to advocate for, that she knows she needs a strong legal education to help her get to that next step. She knows she's gonna be taught how to think critically and to be strategic. And, you know, um, she doesn't spend a lot of the personal statements specifically on like why Southwestern. So she does just kind of like throw it in at the tail end, but it, it still works, um, it's not, it's not super specific, but um, I can definitely see the thread kind of all throughout um, based on some of the things that she had shared. Okay, okay so those were some of the excerpts. Um, so any initial reactions? Did you guys have any reactions that you wanna share about reading some of those things? Were you surprised by what you read or is that pretty much on point with what you would expect to find in a personal statement? Anybody want to share? 
Uh, Cameron? Hi, yes. Uh, so um, I've read in some places that uh, people should try to avoid bringing in uh, childhood stuff into their personal statements and they should focus on what they've done like during college and post-college. Um, do you have anything to say on that or it doesn't it, not really matter if you're drawing from those you know earlier experiences as well? So I think the advice is generally good advice but here's the delineator. What some people do is on their resume they might list things they did in high school. Nobody cares about that. Um, they don't care where you went to high school, what sports team you played on in high school. Nobody cares about anything like that. That re really life on your resume should really begin at the college level. Um, excuse me. Unless you had some particularly amazing accomplishment, like you were on the Junior Olympics or something like that, you know, and, and probably if you were on an Olympic team, you're gonna put it somewhere else and not just like drop it on your person, you know, on your resume. So um, I think where somebody might have come from with that piece of advice is the still unfortunate situation of personal statements that say, I wanted to be a lawyer since I was five years old, or my, my mother said I should be a lawyer because I like to argue. Like, that's very cliche, but it also happens too much. We still see that. That's what I would say, like, don't talk about being like five years old, but I think we are as adults product of, products of who we were as children. And sometimes things that happen to you when you are very young cast a huge spotlight or shadow on who you turn into as an adult. So if what you want to talk about starts at childhood and it kind of did in both of these examples i didn't really think about that when i when i used their excerpts in, in particular um it's the background it's the foundation but you know if what you want to really talk about is you know why you want to get into real estate you probably don't have a ton to say about that from like when you were a child unless what you were experienced as a child was like, I don't know, maybe eviction and being displaced, you know, from your family. And that's why you want to get into, you know, real estate law to work on, you know, property rights for, you know, people or something like that. So it, it just depends. There's a lot of it depends in, uh, in a lot of these types of questions. But does that help? Yes, it did. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So next up that I see hand raised is hi, Lisa. Nicholas it's Paul. Julie. Oh, hi, Julie. Before, hi. Before we take um, Nicholas, I did want to give you a question from the chat. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The question is from Charlie and it says, how should one convey how his or her prior professional skills transfer to the legal profession? I've seen a few questions similar to this asked, so. Okay. Um, so this is for Charlie. So how does one take their professional skills? Um, I think it depends on if you're in an arena already where it's like a natural progression. So for example, if somebody's worked in a law office, you've been a legal assistant or a paralegal, um, and it just sort of seems like the next, you know, the linear path takes you now to going to law school. I think that's very direct and straightforward and can um, be effective in a personal statement. I think there's also sometimes big departures um, and somebody could talk about, you know, wanting to have more career fulfillment or if there's been like a spark in something in their personal life or, or something they feel really called to the law about, you know, we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, interest or resurgence in social justice issues. Um, I think you can definitely incorporate your professional, your former professional experience and you could maybe talk about skills that you built in that profession and how they could translate to law or how you would, um, you know, hope to grow. So I, I hope that answers your question, Charlie. You can chime in here if you want um, something further clarified. So specifically, I have an information technology background and mm -hmm. I have, uh, specific types like cyber law and there's mm -hmm. specific skills that also that are required for that industry that is also required for law like analytical skills, critical thinking. 
So my concern was how to convey that without sounding like a resume on a personal statement. So I think, I mean, is that what you want to spend your personal statement though talking about is why your current professional experience puts you on, you know, a similar pathway? Is that what you've already decided no. you want to write on? Well, I just want to convey what makes me stand out amongst other candidates with, with the same educational background, but without mm -hmm. the other skills that I have. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a blend of what you do put on your resume, which I think is going to be important. Um, you can always write an addendum if you feel like you want to draw particular attention to some common skills. Um, but then I would probably just hone in on, on something a little bit more particular. Like if you're really interested in cyber law, for example, you could write your personal statement on why you're interested in cyber law and how you would take your current and existing knowledge and apply that to what you hope you would get from a law degree. Okay. Okay, great. So um, next up, Nicholas Paul McQuiston. Thank you. First off, yeah. appreciate it. Um, how does the personal statement differ fundamentally from like a cover letter for a professional job application? If, if it does? And... Um, well, first of all, that you can write in first person. Um, some cover letters I've seen somebody still can sometimes write in third person. Um, although I guess there's, there's a mixture, but I think the tone can be a little bit more familiar. Um, it allows for more of that, like background information about yourself. Um, that's personal, not just, you know, I had this job and this job and I learned how to do these skills and these skills. It, it's definitely more, I mean, as the name suggests, it is more personal in nature. Um, and I think a cover letter on the whole kind of is like a broad sweep of experiences, whereas the personal statement usually is much more tailored and honing in on perhaps one or two things. So even if it were a professional experience that you wanted to talk about in your personal statement, which can go over really well, you wouldn't talk about every professional experience. Whereas a cover letter is, you know, real, the cover letter really is the narrative of the resume, right? Whereas the personal statement shouldn't look at all like the narrative of a, of a resume. Does that help? It does, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Ian Kelly. Hello, Dean Gear. thanks a lot for doing Hi. this. Sure. Uh, I actually had two questions here. Uh, okay. you know, uh, the, the first one, a personal statement. Um, the intent obviously is to, to, to show yourself at a very basic and honest level, but I imagine there is such a thing as is going too far as this is not a creative writing project, uh, nor is it a therapy session or a diary or a journal. So um, I'm just trying to gain better insight from your perspective on where that line is. Um, I guess it goes back to judgment and um, reminding yourself of the subjectivity of the review process, you know, and, and also that exercise where I mentioned you want to give it to different people. I wouldn't just give it to people that, you know, are tutors or work in writing centers, or I wouldn't even just give it to people that like, know you, know you really, really well. I think oftentimes they kind of forgive all the things that you give them because they love you and everything you do sounds great. I would give it to maybe somebody who you see as more of a mentor um, type of person and that this is really from a content. This is not grammar Because they can t they might have a little bit, you know, better judgment to to give you advice based on um, If they feel it's a little too, you know, if, if they're reading it and they've got that like internal cringe uh, That's that's a red flag um, You don't want anybody to cringe reading your statement. I think that's a given but I have definitely cried and I wouldn't say I cried because what they shared was too personal. It was just real. And so I have cried in person though, meeting somebody too and listening to them tell me all the things that they've overcome. The, the first person that I gave the excerpts from, sample one, um, I, I met her in a waitlist interview and um, I, I cried probably 10 minutes into our actual conversation because I was so 
overwhelmed on the things that she shared. And I was so impressed. So, I mean, it was like a, it, it, I definitely didn't cringe, but they were hard things that she told me about that she had gone through. And I guess it, I, you know, I guess it is a little bit like a journal or a diary sometimes when we read these things, because they can get really deep and people do go through a lot. Um, but you just got to keep the tone professional. That's, that's the really important part. And um, slim it down some. Usually I feel like the longer the statements are, the more it kind of goes off the road and um, can kind of go a different direction and become a little bit too personal. Um, so if you're, if you're sticking within that like two to three pages, you probably find that you have to cut a lot of material and that will help just kind of organically reel it back in. Okay, thank you. Um, the second one, if you don't mind, uh, you touched on uh, the excerpt we looked at a second ago. Uh, that individual had a, had a background being a foster child where they were very focused on entering family law and obviously justifiably so. Um, when you, if you don't see any mention of an applicant's intent to study a particular area of the law within their personal statement, is that alarming to you or is there some understanding that we're coming into this carte blanche and no. a lot in West with one L? And I don't, I don't personally, my personal feeling, I don't personally care if you tell me what type of law you're interested in or not. Um, because even if you did, I wouldn't hold you to it. I wouldn't expect that you wouldn't change your mind or that you couldn't change your mind. I would hope you would keep an open mind. Um, so no, I don't personally care if you do or you don't mention a particular area of law. I think if you do mention an area of law, you should give me some reason as to why, um, because that's just logical, but don't feel compelled to write about that if that's not what you want to say. Okay, thanks a great deal. Sure. Okay, next up is going to be Brendan De La Cruz. Hello. Um, Hi. So, um, when applying to law school, um, I'm really particular about wanting to go to school in California, um, ideally Southern California. And I know that when you mentioned potential topics for um, for a personal statement, you mentioned that we can write about like why law or why a particular area of law or why a location. Um, do you think that's a, a suitable topic to write a, a personal statement about, about um, why about why I want to go to law school in Southern California specifically? Um, do you think that's okay to write about or should it be more based around Southwestern or any advice? I think you can. I don't think you have to. Um, we ask a question on our application and I think that's a pretty standard question as to what other law schools you're applying to. Um, most people answer the question. It's just, mm -hmm. it kind of gets to some of what you're asking about. If you list only law schools in Southern California, I'm pretty much going to guess you just want to stay in Southern California. <laughs> yeah. um, where sometimes that information helps us also is if it, if it says to me that you live in Oklahoma mm -hmm. and you list only schools in California, again, I get it. You just want to, you want to move to California. Mm -hmm. That's clear. If you list only schools that have, programs, let's say in entertainment law, do you pick, you know, schools in LA and you pick schools in New York and you also answer the question, you know, the, what areas of law you might be interested in, right? We can kind of draw connections and, and bridge pieces of information from stuff like that. Um, so we're, you know, when we look at the file, we're looking at lots of different little chunks of data and we're building assumptions and allowing all of the information that we're reading to either kind of confirm or deny the assumptions that we that we're making. So mm -hmm. I, I don't really care if you want to just be in Southern California. So that's great, but it doesn't really matter to me mm -hmm. specifically. Um, but if that's what you want to write on and you want to write about, you know, because your family is here or because this is where your areas of focus really are concentrated, that, I think that's fine. I just don't think you have to. Sure. Um, so do you think it'd be better hypothetically to write uh, more about why Southwestern specifically focus it more around the school rather than the location? Or do you think that they're, they, they're considered equal? Like the, 
In other words, one isn't. If one. I had to pick one or the other, and mm -hmm. those were the only things that I was considering, I would guess I'd rather know why my school okay. than, than a region. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you. Sure. Okay, so the next one is going to be, is it Aja Davies? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Did I say your name right? Uh, Asia. Okay, great. It's okay. <laughs> Everyone pronounces it wrong, but... That's okay. That's how we um, learn. Yeah, this kind of goes off of what Brendan was saying. Um, do you like when applicants, like, mention specific programs or clinics that the school offers because it shows, like, they did their research, or does it go along the lines of just telling what admissions what they want to hear? Or, you know, you know, it's obvious if you want to study this law, we have this program. Or do you think it's important to mention specifics? I think if it's genuine and it doesn't look like you just plopped something in, then mm -hmm. I think it's fine. I think it can be helpful. Um, yeah, just do it. Do it. If you're going to do it, do it well. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, Miguel Palacios? Hi. Yeah. Um, so I kind of um, had a two part uh, question here was um, the first thing was um, when writing a personal statement, should we be addressing a certain person or a specific committee or anything like that? Or should it just be like, you know, In like letter format? Should it say like, yeah. Dear Dean Gear, right? No, it shouldn't. There's, you're, you're not addressing it to anybody. You okay? You don't. Yeah. No. Okay. And then um, this this other part, it's kind of just like a general question of because um, I was like the other gentleman where I'm only applying to schools in California, um, and I was just when he mentioned that it came to mind like. I was wondering if it looks, uh, if it reflects poorly that I'm applying to a large number of schools in California. Like, does as it in, look as in every every school in California? Um, not in ev not to everyone, but like, just you know, does it look does it look poor that you know I'm not just picking like a small amount of schools to apply to? Um, well, I mean, I think applicants should apply to as many schools as they are interested in. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you're saying or not, but if you are legitimately interested in attending 10 schools, 12 schools, or, you know, something like that, um, then I think that's your truth and that's who you put down. You know, what we see though, and cause we can get some statistical data on, on applicants and sometimes on, on the individual level, um, not who, but just like how many people, sometimes applicants will apply to 75 schools mm. or 80 schools because they get a fee waiver and they're just like, oh, what the heck, why not? Right. Right. And, uh, that's not a good look. That really shows, right? You're, you're really not interested. There's no way you're interested in 80 schools. Mm -hmm. um, nobody could be interested in going to right. 80 schools. <laughs> but I think you could legitimately be interested in maybe 10 schools or so. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, your job as the applicant at this point, right, is figuring out based on what you know so far, which handful of schools you're really interested in, mm -hmm. in pursuing then you cast your net, right? You, you throw that out there and then you put it in the hands of the admissions offices at those mm -hmm. schools. And then you wait obviously to hear who you're going to get decisions from that are yes or no, or the maybes, which are like the wait list. Mm -hmm. In that process, it's going to get refined, right? The no's obviously come off the list. Right. And the ones where you have yeses, you know, hopefully you do get a few yeses because then mm -hmm. you can make you know, another tier of decision making, right. um, you know, whether it's scholarships or really digging deep on their programs and their curriculum and then engagement with their students and alums and faculty, right? That's usually kind of how everything ultimately 
gets figured out. Um, so I think, you know, it's okay. It's okay to apply to a quote unquote large number of schools, but I think that still needs to be like a reasonable number. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like my concern was basically like, that I also just I should to... say that question is optional you don't have to answer it uh-huh many, many people do but you okay. don't have to yeah because a few of the places that I've already like completed applications for have specifically asked like what other schools have you applied to and like list them here yeah. and you know and so that's that was one of the reasons why I was asking but my main concern was just that, you know, I, I, I have like the, the academic record to get in without a problem and everything, but I just know that like I've had things happen in my past that might keep me from like appearing as a good candidate. So my main concern was just like, applying to make sure that I get in somewhere you know what I mean Mm -hmm. and so I just I'm trying to balance between making sure I get in and not looking like you know overly desperate I guess you should I could say well you know ultimately you have to be comfortable with what you submit and so like Mm -hmm. I said that's an optional question if you're worried about that you can leave it blank um what I my last comment though on what you said is I would make sure and this, this is true for anybody, you have to take a step back from what you submit and you have to look at it through the lens of another person. This, this is on your application as a whole. You have to have enough self-awareness to say, these are potential concerns, these are potential red flags, these are potential questions that the reader may have about my aptitude in law school or my readiness, right? So those can be things like changing your major in college a bunch of times. It can be about having a lot of W's. It can be having no work experience. Um, it can, whatever you think could be a concern or a question, you need to be on the front side of that and you should submit an addendum. Mm-hmm. Um, and you take the position in the affirmative to just explain. So mm-hmm. I'm not gonna spend really any more time on that now because I'm actually gonna cover more of that in a, a presentation next month. but. Okay you know, there, there are lots of ways to kind of make sure you've put everything out there that you need to. And then okay. after that, it's out of your hands. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So we are technically about 10 minutes over. Um, I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes and do some more questions. If you would like to stay with me, if you need to go, you are absolutely free to go. Um, no offense will be taken if you, if you need to leave. Um, so, Probably I'll stay on for about another 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so max. Okay, so um, next question I have up is going to be Simran. Hi there, it's Simran, but it's okay. Simran. Thank you. No, thank you for correcting me. So I have a question regarding candidates who are taking a narrative approach to their personal statement. We talked a little bit about background information and how two, three paragraphs would do well. But as far as someone who is going, talking about a little bit about their past and showing them who, you know, they are, and then going into their present work and how it's related to their work in the law, and then going into the future, as someone on the admissions council, what would you like to see in a candidate's personal statement when it takes a narrative approach that leaves the most impact? Um... I honestly don't really think I can give you an answer. I don't think it's like one thing. I think the most important thing anybody can do to make sure um, that it's well received is just that it's it's well written. That's really important. Um, we have a large number of people on our admissions committee who are legal writing faculty, and they are I mean they're sticklers. So for them, anything that is not polished is disruptive. So it doesn't really matter what you say about yourself, right? It doesn't go over well. Um, so that's kind of where you have to get back to like the details and, the, and all of that kind of stuff. I think in the narratives, you know, uh, what some people sometimes do, I think incorrectly 
is they start off and they, you know, tell you the story and they, they go and like now you're kind of like cresting and then you just, it kind of just drops off. Like, so I think when you do a narrative, you've got to have a really good, your, your beginning, your middle and your end all have to be equally strong. I think that's really important. Um, and make sure you kind of have a good flow. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, Elizabeth Morehouse again. Hi. Um, I just want to say that kind of coming into this, I was really struggling bouncing off the like, different ideas of if it's better to go down a specific path of the, um, my area of interest, uh, focus more so on academics and what like experience that I've had or other like life and work um, experience that I've had that have led me to that interest and how much to kind of focus on this. And it was really eye-opening to see the different uh, samples of the personal statements to see just how personal the personal statement can get without feeling too, as you said, cringy or too intrusive and really um, show that we're allowed to go that deep or that personal in a personal statement this all I think has really helped me wrap my head around it so much that I just really want to express how thankful I am for not just you, but the other two women who are on this call as well, helping Thank out. Thank you, Elizabeth, that's really sweet. Um, and I will say, you know, I, I maybe this is my own bias with the files, you know, um, I tend to gravitate, just personally as a reader, I tend to gra gravitate towards statements and individuals who I feel like are being a little more vulnerable. Um, and maybe because I feel like they have higher stakes in doing so, but that doesn't mean, right? So just because I personally gravitate towards it doesn't mean that, you know, if someone doesn't, somehow that's a negative cast against them. It's not true. Um, there are plenty of other great personal statements, um, you know, and, and Julie and Roxana, you guys, please feel free to chime in anytime um, that we read that are more stoic, I suppose, in tone, um, and don't necessarily get into anything that's painful. Um, you can write a great personal statement about a lot of things, and I can still get to know who you are, or feel like I get to know who you are without bearing so much personal information. But if what you want to share, if you're comfortable sharing, you know, then by all means, you can, you can certainly do so too. So it's, it's really just up to the individual. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so Heaven, you're up next. Heaven Finney. Hi. Hi. It's actually my daughter's name. I didn't know how to change it. So I'm oh. Antoinette Blade. <laughs> well, I'll tell you now, if you go, if you hover over your own picture, there's three uh -huh. dots in the upper right-hand corner. And you just okay. right click and you'll see rename. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry about Welcome. that. That's okay. Your um, daughter's name is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if you're able to answer this question because obviously you have, you spent a great deal reading them and not writing them. But if you're someone who's struggling with like just getting pinned to a paper, like, <laughs> do you have any suggestions or anything or I could try or where I could start? Cause like, I don't mind writing, but for some reason, writing this personal statement is like the hardest thing I'm having. It's really hard. Over. I know. <laughs> I would, I would definitely just try to do some free writing. I mentioned earlier trying to maybe, I don't know, pick three to five topics and just, I mean, just literally just start going, just free write. Don't worry at that point at all about, you know, your grammar or, you know, the flow, just, you really just need to get a feel for what you want to talk about. And you need to know once you really start in the exercise, like what are, which ones can you um, develop further? And I think the only way you do that is, you know, literally just start trying them. If you really can't write about a specific topic, you really have nothing to say about it. You just got this intense writer's block for it. You just got to move on to a different topic. Um, but always go back though to what I said about what would you say? Like if I said, what is your real name? It's not heaven. What is your name? <laughs> it's Antoinette. <laughs> Antoinette. Okay. So if I said Antoinette, I'm going to have you come in and you're going to meet with one of our faculty members on the admissions committee. Okay. 
it's, this is your admissions interview. And I'm not going to tell you any of the questions they're going to ask because I don't know what they're going to ask or what they're going to want to learn about you. You're going to start thinking as you prepare for your interview, as I know you would. Okay, well, I know I want to tell them why I want to go to Southwestern. I know I'm going to tell them that. And I know I want to tell them that one of the reasons I first knew I wanted to go to law school was because I was unfairly terminated from my job. And I want to tell them that um, I use that as an opportunity to reinvent myself. And I went back to school and I found a new calling and I want to help people in employment law because, you know, I was wronged and I want to turn this around and make sure other people don't experience what I did. Right. Obviously I'm just making all this stuff up, but those are all things you might expect to say in an interview, right? If mm -hmm. Professor Smith says, so Antoinette, why do you want to go to law school? You'd ha you would obviously have answers for that. So you have to just peel it back, start from another angle. Don't worry again, this is not a creative writing exercise. What is the heart of it? What is the truth that you want to convey? Okay. Those, that's how you got to start with your topics. Right? That's how you're whittled down to the what you're going to focus on. Then you have the actually harder part of how to convey it all. <laughs> right. Um, but I think you need to just start at the basics of the topics. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Um, Elizabeth Mejia Castro, do you have another question? So you spoke about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I was planning to do all of my vulnerability and my diversity statement. Okay. Um, is there, have you ever encountered another admissions person that just stops reading the file or is there, is, is there a somewhat of a, of an obligation, no matter which law school it is that the entire file is examined? Cause my, my personal statement is going along the lines of it's, it's a little emotional, but it's pretty much matter of fact. Okay. Um, well, I can't speak for every reader out there, obviously. But I know for us and my colleagues who I consider to know well, if it's something in our application that we either make optional or obviously if something is required, then we read um, I think where some students find themselves kind of along the lines of what you're concerned about is if you don't follow the directions. So if a school specifically says it cannot be more than three pages, in, uh, in the format where we used to have paper files, now everything is electronic, but I think the same thing could still happen. I definitely know readers at other schools who would not read past page three if that's all they said you could submit. So, I mean, in some cases, they literally tore those pages off and threw them in the trash when they were paper files. So I think as long as you're following the rules, um, I don't think you should worry about somebody just glossing over your contents and not reading it, especially because, you know, what we're talking about also is diversity statement versus personal statement. Diversity statements are really common, I feel like, at most schools. We accept them, and a lot of students submit them. I don't have a percentage, but I would say it's probably half. So I think we're just used to having multiple statements to read, and the benefit of submitting two statements um, since we're on the topic, is that oftentimes people really do have a lot they want to convey about themselves, and you can't really do so in, if you're one of those people, in just one document. And so allowing yourself the space to have two can help you break up your, talk, your topics a little bit, and it's, it's more palatable for the reader. Like, I would rather read two different statements that totaled six pages than one single topic that was six pages, if that makes sense. So um, I don't think you should worry about them not reading it necessarily, so long as you're following the directions. Thank you, that's very helpful. Sure. Um, Alana, 
Is it Alana or Elena Johnson? Alana. Alana. Can you hear me? Hi. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. This has been extremely helpful. Good, um, wow. One question I do have. As someone who's been out of school for quite some time at this point, it's been about a decade, um, the question that I have is when it comes to having people read over my personal statement, I'm kind of at a loss right now, or I don't really know where to go, being that I don't have a backing of a university at this point, like a center to go into. Do you have any suggestions of where to really look for that kind of review? Sure. Um, are you working somewhere now? Yes, I am a flight attendant. So again, okay. it's not really a career where there's, it's not really any academia involved at this point. So okay. I'm kind of like, I don't really know where to go for this. So I think you hopefully have people that can help you with mm -hmm. um, like the tone and the content, right? Those would be perhaps coworkers or more family or friends. Mm -hmm. I think, okay, so we didn't, Again, we can't cover everything just under personal statement heading, but one thing that you can do, and, and sometimes I do suggest to prospective students, is um, to reach out to local attorneys. Okay. Um, and, and really, the, the purpose of an exercise like that in reaching out to a local attorney, and it's kind of like a cold call, right? It's just kind of yeah. like... <laughs> Hey, Attorney Johnson, I know you don't know me, right? It can, it can be awkward, so I, I understand that. But you want to basically have some kind of dialogue that suggests that you are interested in talking with them, right? Pre-COVID, mm -hmm. it could be like, could we meet for coffee or could I come to your office or, you know, can we just schedule a phone call, right? Whatever it sort of seems reasonable and safe and pragmatic. But just mm -hmm. say, you know, I'm, I'm applying to law schools, you know, you practice an area of law I'm interested in, you know, I'm not exactly sure yet what I want to do with my law degree, but, you know, I am interested in a couple different things. And, and I saw on your website, you practice these things. Um, you know, do you have a few minutes that I could talk to you, right? This is, you, you got to play a long game with things like this, right? It's not, it's not necessarily going to be that this person turns into your mentor, but sometimes, sometimes, the right organic situation, you know, can, can yield you something like that. And, um, you know, if you strike up a conversation with them, if you have a good rapport, maybe you'll get to the point where you feel comfortable saying, you know, would you mind, you know, um, I've been out of school a long time and, you know, I really want to make sure I do this right. Would you mind, could it, would you mind taking a look at my personal statement just to give me some initial feedback? You know, I promise you know, my feelings won't be hurt. I, I just want some constructive criticism. Yeah. I, I think most people, if they've already said yes to talking to you, I think most people, maybe a couple conversations in, you know, might be willing to look at it. Okay. Um, but, you know, not everybody has a school center to go back to or professors they're still in contact with. I mean, you've got to work with what you have. But... You know, you probably have a more varied network of people than maybe you are thinking about, you know, and, uh, and maybe ask a few so you can get a good kind of cross sampling of, the, of feedback. Great. Thank you. That's actually really helpful. I have a couple of names that just popped in my head. Good. That, so good. Thank you. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Any other questions? We have time for probably one more before we take off. Okay. Is it Sicily? Yes, you said it right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> um, so, actually, well, one, thank you for the session. I've gotten a lot of great tips. Great. Um, but listening to the other participants, I started, like, developing, like, even more questions. So... Um, oh, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one is, one, I wasn't originally going to do a diversity statement because I know that it wasn't, like, mandatory and that it is something that's optional. Um but now, like, listening to everybody, I think I do want to include one, but then it kind of, I think I kind of confused myself because now I'm not sure which topics to put in the personal statement and which topics to put in the diversity statement. So do you have any advice as to, like, Well, first I would say don't feel compelled to write a diversity statement. Okay. Just because I said a lot of people do. Okay. Don't. One of the best things you can do, right, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to contradict myself here, but this is nevertheless... <laughs> 
everything I've said, I still stand behind. It's just, there's a lot of caveats. <laughs> one of the best things you can do in your application is, I think it's one of the tips, is to be judicious. You can't say everything. Right. Right. You can't. So you got to figure out what's most important, you know, and just focus on that. It's better if you wrote, you know, an A++ personal statement than to write two B minuses. Okay. Right. Okay. Or whatever, you know, scale you want to think of them on. So use an optional statement like a diversity statement if you really feel like you've got enough content for two. Okay. And that you really feel like you can deliver two outstanding ones. Okay. Um, that's where you can use something else. And if you're just like, man, I'm so awesome. I have so much to say about myself. I need some more space. Right. <laughs> and, that, and sometimes that's okay. true for people, you know, or they write like, the term diversity, I will say also kind of throws off some because for some people, they think it has a really narrow definition right. and it only applies to like racial or ethnic diversity or even like sexual orientation or gender. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it is anything that makes you who you are, because like right. I said at the very beginning, no one else is you. So we've had diversity statements on being in the military. We've had diversity statements on speaking three or four languages and being, you know, incredibly multicultural. We've had diversity statements written on uh, being deaf and, you know, existing primarily in a hearing world. We've had diversity statements written on, um, you know, sometimes some physical challenges or um, learning challenges that people, you know, might have experienced or witnessed um, the results of. And, you know, that really has shaped that. It, it can really be anything. Just like the personal statement can basically be anything. Um, so use it if you need it. Okay. But don't write something else just for the sake of writing it. Because if you do, um, it shows. Okay, so you kind of led me to my next thing that I was kind of thinking about. So I was in the military. And I know one of the other participants was asking about how do you convey like transitions if you weren't personally like working at a law firm. And I was in a whole different industry. Like how do I, is there any advice on how I can kind of translate like my military and basically current career to like to law or to, or should it go in one of the, like, should that be something that's in the diversity statement? Or? Is this something you're thinking about for your personal statement? Are it you was. about writing about your military experience? Part so, of it, yes ma'am. Um, okay, let me think about some <laughs> examples. So I've seen personal statements talk about for people who were in the military, talk mm -hmm. about things they saw if they were stationed in other parts of the world. Right. And how it opened their eyes to things they never knew about when they were here, pre-military. Um, and how it's just changed them and it's given them greater purpose. I've seen people talk about the skills that they've learned, right? Sometimes those are things that you kind of have to draw connections to, but sometimes they're a little more obvious, right? So they, they talk about the determination that you have to have right. and the strength of character and strength of body. They talk about, um, you know, what maybe that meant to them in a positive or in a negative way how that experience, you know, transpired. Um, they've talked about wanting to continue their service to their country. And this is another way they feel like they can serve their country slash their community. That's the way um, I was leading. That when you said that's the kind of direction I was kind of leaning yeah. towards. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that sounds great. Okay. All right, cool. <laughs> um, it just, just depends on which way you want to go. 
All right, cool beans. Thank you so much. You're very again. welcome. Sure. Okay. okay, so are we all set? Does everybody feel like if they had a question, they've had a chance to get it answered? I don't want to leave anybody hanging. I know there was so many questions in the Q&A. So thanks again to Roxana and for Julie handling all of that. Oh, okay. And I, I hear, I see Jenny and I'm not sure who said, was that Benjamin? Yes, please. Okay, so Jenny, you go, and then Benjamin, you can go right after her. Okay, um, my first question is, um, would it look bad if we choose not to write the schools that we are also applying to? Like, would that kind of have an effect to, like, kind of make you wonder why we aren't deciding to write them? No. No? No, it's okay. I mean, we're nosy, but... Uh, <laughs> I can admit that we're nosy and most schools ask it um, and most okay. students answer it, but you don't have to. Okay, awesome. Um, and so, and my other question is kind of about the personal statement because I know how um, you were talking about the diversity statement is kind of like if you need more space to kind of either elaborate on something or bring something else up. Um, if we bring up a certain um, life event that shaped us in the personal statement but um it's i guess in a sense a little like too personal maybe for the personal statement would it be recommended to elaborate on that on the diversity statement or just kind of leave you i guess guessing i think the litmus test about what is personal versus too personal is really mm -hmm. up to you to decide if something is too personal to you then it doesn't belong anywhere regardless of the document. If it's something that you are comfortable with and you want to share it, it doesn't really matter which document you put it in. Okay, awesome. thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and Benjamin. Um, yeah. I would like to know if um, you have a religious background. You went to a theological seminary. Um, it's okay to state it in your personal statement. But uh, prior to having a theological um, degree, I am a researcher. I'm a, um, I'm a science researcher. Now I've worked in the medical field for nine years. But then I just wanted to know if it is appropriate for me to state that in my personal statement because um, talking to someone... Um, about it, I was just um, deliberating away it with someone that is it appropriate, and um, the person was like, "No, um, it is not good to show my uh, or to talk about my religious affiliation uh, when writing a personal statement." So I would like to. Know. I don't think there's anything wrong with talking about religion if it's important to you. Uh, people do it quite often, actually. You know, we have. And maybe this is a product of just our school and how diverse our population of students are and, and who we attract, but um, we have people talk about it all the time, you know, people whose families fled their home countries because of religious persecution or families who were, you know, destroyed because of the Holocaust or you know, some diversity statements have been written because maybe in their home countries, they're part of a religious minority um, and how that's affected them. I, I, I don't personally have any advice against writing about religion, um, if that's paramount to who you are and something you think you want to convey and can do it in um, sort of the context of the personal statement overall. I don't have any problem with that. All right. Um, thank Where you so much. I guess much. maybe I would caution you is if you were applying to law schools that have a religious affiliation on their own, some are more welcoming to other religions than others, maybe. And so Certainly. that's really up to you to figure out if you're a good fit for them, period, regardless of what you write about. Um, that's the only sort of caution I would give you though is, and that's really more about between you and a school that already has a religious affiliation. All right, 
uh, I think uh, he said uh, something on those lines, the other lines that you just said. Okay. That, uh, yeah, sometimes they think it's more of a, a discriminatory. Yeah, but most schools do not have a religious affiliation. And most religious affiliated schools that I know, most of them are also incredibly welcoming of other faiths. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, Rashara? Hi, thank you for taking time out. I know we're over time. Um, That's okay. This always happens. I have never done one of these on time in my life. So no reason to have assumed today would have been any different. Okay. Um, for the diversity statement, I, I just had a question because for the personal statement, I know how we can tie it back to why we want to go to law school, specifically Southwestern. For the diversity statement, when we talk about whatever experience that we want to talk about, are we supposed to also connect it back to this is why I want to go to law school? Like, how do I, I guess, I don't want to make it too much like a personal statement. So I guess I want to say like, you know, do we just kind of end it there with our experience or does that make sense? Yeah, I get it. You don't want to just regurgitate the same sort of like closing lines necessarily about why you want to go to law school. Right. But I also just don't want to spit information out about, you know, experience. Um, yeah, I'd say it's probably something in the, in between. Okay. I think it, the, the, the unsaid perhaps, and definitely implied aspect about everything in your application should be why you want to go to law school. This right. is what you're applying for. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not overtly saying, I want to go to law school because, which you may not, you may not actually say that. Um, that's still kind of the takeaway. So, so long as that's still being communicated, there's no real like format you have to follow. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. So Julie put in the chat um, our contact information. Um, Julie, can you also throw up just the admissions inbox one too, please? And um, Julie and Roxana, did you guys have any last remarks or comments or anything that you wanted to share with the group? No, I don't think so. Um, I would just say it's going to work out. No matter what happens, it'll work out. That's all I would say. Great. Thanks, Roxana. Mm -hmm. Julie, anything you want to add? Sure. Just, um, you know, if any questions come up at any point, you know, after you've sat down and kind of thought about everything that we went over today, um, there's no question that's too silly or a waste of time. So please do reach out to us. We're happy to help at any point. And thanks for coming. It was great to see everybody. Yes, definitely. Thank you all. Oh, and I didn't Thank put this too. on my don'ts, but I would say don't send us weird photos. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that or any, really any photos. <laughs> that, that's an easier rule to follow. Don't send photos. <laughs> We get a little too shocked by some of them sometimes. Um, okay, well, I think we are all set. And um, thank you guys for sticking around uh, an extra 40 minutes. Hopefully you found it to be helpful. And um, we'll have lots more events actually coming. I, I think I saw in the chat, there was something about the speaker that we have on Monday evening. It's gonna be our SBA president, it kicks off a what we're calling our Southwestern Spotlight. It's gonna feature students and alums in alternating Mondays. So look out there for that schedule. They'll be, they're just getting finalized and posted now. There's also gonna be the next Insider's Perspective workshop is going to be on the LSAT and LSAT Flex. That's gonna be um, early in October. And then mid-October, we're gonna do a mock admissions committee. So you're gonna hear some of the same information because we're definitely going to talk about the personal statement but we'll have different examples and we'll go through really kind of everything that's in the application so we'll spend some time on the letters of rec agenda um how gpas are calculated um really the the whole the whole shebang so that's going to be october 15th i want to say cecily did you have a last question It's not a me. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, I did have this. I did, doesn't have anything to do with the personal statement, but it's just a quick question. I was at the LawSat um, 
LSAT forum yesterday, and they were saying mm -hmm. that um, Southwestern is going to be, looks like you guys are going to be in their gray room. We um, are going to be the in the gray room. Thanks for the, the plug. Forum. Yes. So <laughs> we'll be at the forum on Saturday, September 26th. That's 3 to 7 p.m. Eastern time or 12 to 4 p.m. Pacific time. Um, it's free. You can still sign up. Um, our booth is going to be, yes, in the gray exhibit hall. We're also going to be having, um, you'll get an email if you're subscribed to candidate referral service and, and stuff like that, or how you got this invitation to begin with. Um, and we'll put it on our website. We're going to have a live Zoom, something like this, with um, okay. some members of our community, some faculty members and, and students and whatnot, in addition to being in the booth. So some of us will be there chatting and, and doing that. Some are going to be in the live video chat. So um, you can kind of find us in both places. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be there. Make sure you, you know, all the documents and videos and whatnot that are going to be um, in our booth are already on our website. So you can browse the website at your leisure. Um, but yes, we will be at all the forums. And they're all okay. that same time block, regardless of the day that the forum takes place. And there's okay, workshops during the forums, um, financing your education. You can talk to pre-law advisors, um, Forum 101. The, for, the info sessions and the workshops start before the forum, I think an hour before. So mm -hmm. you can start early and maybe do like a Forum 101 kind of workshop. And um, they'll continue, I think they go through the forum, maybe even extend past it. So um, you, you, there's a lot to do there. What I would caution is because it's really easy when you get to a booth to start clicking away on like looking at the catalog and watching the videos, you might have a harder time getting to as many schools um, as you would have if the forum were in person where you just like would walk by and collect a brochure to look at it later. So just be cognizant of how long you're spending in any one booth so you can maximize your time. Okay, and during that, will we have the opportunity to um, speak with someone from Southwestern like on a one-on-one, -on -one, or is it just going to all be kind of in a group? So in the forum booth, there's the chat. If you, you'll see, okay, so the way, I didn't get to watch yesterday's, but hopefully they showed you what the chat will look like. And, yeah, they did. Okay, so in the chat, you'll see all the schools that are participating in the chat. Then if you were to click on Southwestern, you would see who's online in that moment for you to chat with. Okay. You can either go to our general chat room where everybody will see everything, or you can initiate a chat with say just myself or just with Julie, and that's one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. And then in the, um, the Zoom thing that we're gonna do, there might be one-on-ones. We might do them as breakouts or smaller group, um, but you'll, you'll always have an opportunity to do something one-on-one. -on -one. You can you can email the office or call the office now if you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment. So um, that's always on the table. It doesn't have to just be within the times of these events. Okay. All right, cool beans. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sure. Okay, everyone. I hope you have a good uh, rest of your day. Have a great weekend. Um, stay safe and um, look out for some of our other events. I hope you join us uh, for the series and look forward to your applications if you're going to be applying this year.